Hello everyone and welcome to my YouTube channel. Well, channel, it's not much of a channel yet. There's only one video. But I guess it's a start. We all have to start somewhere. And this video will be about installing a rotary axis on your CNC machine. Now, the reason for choosing this subject is that I struggled a little bit myself when I was first uh, trying to get my rotary axis up and running because on the internet obviously there is some information here and there but as far as I saw there wasn't really one single place where all the information that you need was gathered in one single uh, website or video so that's why I decided to make this video my very first one now I will make a few assumptions in this video and it is first that you already have a fully functional 3-axis CNC machine up and running and that you use Mark 3 as the control software to operate the machine. Now the machine I have behind me is a 3-axis uh, CNC machine that I bought of CNC router parts. It's a CRP4896 Pro which I bought in 2016. In 2017 I bought their um, upgrade kit with a few new elements uh, like new guide rails and, and a few other things and I must say I have been very very happy with it. I'm not sponsored by them whatsoever but if a company makes a good product and gives good service I think it's worth mentioning their name. That's only fair. Anyhow, that is the machine on which I installed my rotary axis and we will go from, uh, from here. In this video I will cover first a few topics about hardware. There are not too many things to know here but a few things that you may consider as, as, as option. Secondly, I will go through a few theoretical things that will allow you to make your own calculations for the numbers that you will need to enter in Mach 3. Then I will talk you with uh, the computer through all the settings you have to set in Mach 3 to make your uh, rotational axis uh, work. Once that is done we will come back to the machine and uh, talk about a few steps that you need to do in order to kind of calibrate the axis you just installed because Mark 3 needs obviously the correct settings but there are a few things that you will need to do at the table measurements to fully calibrate and, and make your axis uh, operational and accurate. After that we will go back to the computer and I will show you with two different software packages how you can um, calculate rotary toolpaths. I will use Vectric and uh, RhinoCam and once that is done we will come back to the machine once more and I'll show you every step I do to set up the job, I do the tool touch off for the cutter I'm gonna use and show you the actual cut itself. And that should cover more or less everything that you will need to know to install your own rotary axis. So let's get started and have fun. Oh yeah, one more thing, since this is my very first video ever, the quality of the images will probably not always be perfect, sometimes they will be out of focus. The editing, I'm very new to editing, I follow the short online course on the use of Adobe Premiere Pro, but I'm an absolute beginner, so please uh, bear with me and I will try to make the information as useful as I can but the form factor hmm, that's gonna be so-so but I'll do my best I promise let's get on with it the first step or the first subject we need to cover is talking a little bit about the hardware now the hardware as you see here is quite straightforward it's actually just a stepper motor that is geared to the actual rotational axis. In my case the gear ratio is 6 to 1 that means that the stepper motor will have to make 6 
full 360 degree uh, rotations in order to make the actual rotational axis rotate one full circle or one full 360 degrees. On the rotational axis there is a chuck much like you find on a lathe and on the other side there is a tailstock also much like you can find on a uh, normal lathe. Here I opted to put both components on spacing blocks and the reason for that obviously is to increase the spacing between the uh, rotation axis and my CNC bed which allows me to cut pieces with larger diameters. One more thing to mention is that um, the stepper motor will obviously need to be wired to a stepper motor driver. In my case the color coding of the wiring that came out with the stepper motor was exactly the same as the color coding that was used for the wires inside my control box that I bought from CNC router parts. So I just hooked up yellow to yellow, red to red and so on and it worked right away. Speaking about stepper motor drivers, you actually have two options. The first option is to provide a dedicated stepper motor driver in your control box that will only be used for the rotational axis. This is by far the best option since it gives you maximum flexibility with maximum ease of use. Now if for some reason it's impossible to add an extra driver in your control box you will have to look for a workaround. A workaround that you can use is um, using one of the stepper drivers for one of the linear axes to drive the rotational axis. In my case my axis is oriented along the y direction of my table. That means once my um, spindle is positioned right over the um, rotationary axis I should theoretically no longer need the use for movements in the X direction. Which means that from that point on I would be able to switch to another Mark 3 profile in which the stepper driver that was previously used to drive the X axis is now driving the rotary axis. So you, you will need to use two different Mark 3 profiles and you would uh, need to connect the stepper uh, motor to the correct output on your CNC control box if you do the change from the linear um, profile to the rotational profile. The disadvantage obviously is the need to use different uh, Mach 3 profiles firstly. Secondly the need to do rewirings every time you change from normal 3 axis cutting to rotational axis cutting. But the biggest disadvantage is that using this method eliminates a few cutting strategies that would otherwise be possible but with this uh, configuration are no longer possible. You could imagine a piece of stock that you put in your, in your, uh, in your chuck and on which you do a 3 axis machining after that you rotate it a number of degrees, let's say 72 degrees and on that new surface you do a new 3 axis machining. If you do work like this you need all 3 axes of the linear uh, axis control and you need at the same time the rotational axis. So that kind of work will no longer be available if you choose for a two profile approach. So in my opinion if you can use a dedicated stepper motor driver which will keep the drivers you have already for your X, Y and Z axis all completely uh, available and at the same time adding a rotational functionality. But those are, those are basically the two possibilities you have from a setup point of view. There's not much more that I can tell you regarding hardware. These things come uh, at different price tags uh, on eBay and, uh, and on other places on the internet. This particular one is probably from, so, from uh, some Chinese manufacturer. I paid about, I think it was uh, about 180 euros if I remember correctly but I must say it works uh, perfectly there are no issues so far that I've discovered and I've seen prices on the internet for European manufacturers like in Germany which go up to 1000 euros for a similar setup so I'm not quite sure um, if, if those setups are worth the money 
but I feel personally that as a uh, if, if you are a woodworker that paying 1000 euros for a setup is really over the top I think that if you pay 200 300 euros you should be uh, really up and running uh, with a good setup okay everyone we are uh, standing here in front of the whiteboard that I installed for this specific occasion I have been uh, willing to install a whiteboard in my workshop uh, since quite a long time um, you know to write small bits and pieces things that I need to bring the next time I go to the hardware store and so on but I thought for this occasion now is the moment to do it so here we are I will explain you a little bit uh, of uh, theoretical knowledge that you will need to, uh, to know in order to make the proper settings for your setup in Mach 3. Uh, in Mach 3 there are a few things that you will need to set, a few of those are just uh, uh, ticking checkboxes, but there are three entries that need calculation based on your own uh, set of parameters. In the motor tuning page you will need to calculate the steps per value, the velocity value and the acceleration value. Now we will start with the calculation of the steps per. And in order to calculate that we need to go through a few phases in the whole concept. First of all I will talk about the stepper motor. The stepper motor is a specific electro motor that is capable of moving in specific discrete steps. So it doesn't move in a continuous way, even though at high speed it looks like that, but it actually moves with deliberate and discrete steps. A lot of stepper motors out there have a step specification of 200. Again, all the numbers that I'm putting here on the blackboard are based on my setup. You have to check your own parameters for the hardware you own in order to make the calculation. But the calculation itself obviously is made in a similar way than what I'm showing you here. My stepper motor, all of them, uh, also the one on the rotational axis, they all have a stepper motor a step count of 200. That means that they are capable of moving in 200 deliberate steps and after 200 steps they have revolved a complete 360 degrees. Now, the neat thing about the stepper drivers are that they are usually capable of delivering smaller than one full pulse pulses. The stepper drivers that I use are capable of working with 10 micro steps. That means that they can um, cut each single full step in 10 smaller micro steps and in fact every time it sends out a step command it is in fact a micro step command so the stepper driver is not counting the number of full steps it just knows the number of micro step it sends out and if it's a stepper driver with 10 micro steps then that means that if it sends 10 micro steps the stepper motor will have moved one full step so, if you have a micro stepper with a specification of 10 micro steps, then in order to move a 200 step stepper motor 360 degrees, the, the driver will have to send 2000 micro steps. In fact, every step command that Mark 3 sends to the driver is interpreted by the driver as a micro step command. So, for a full 360 degree rotation of the stepper motor, Mark 3 will need to command 2000 steps. Now, there is another thing here, that, and that is that most of these rotational axis setups are made such that there is a gearing ratio going on between the axis of the stepper motor and the actual axis which uh, holds the workpiece by means of the chuck. Now, let's say this gear ratio is 1 to 6, which is the case on my setup. That means that if Mark 3 sends 2000 steps to the control box, the control box sends 2000 steps, micro steps I should say, to the, to the stepper motor, the stepper motor will rotate 360 degrees, but the actual axis, the actual rotational axis, will only move one sixth of that. It will only move 
60 degrees in that case. Now, what the steps per setting means, if you're installing a rotational axis, it means how many steps Mark 3 needs to send per single degree. So, in order to calculate that, I would have to calculate 2000 divided by 60 and that would result in one single degree of movement of the actual axis because that's what it's all about. Mark 3 needs to know how many steps it needs to send to let the actual axis on which the workpiece is, is held let, to let that axis rotate one single degree. That's the meaning of steps per. Now, if you divide 2000 by 60, you will end up with 33.3333 and a couple more. Three de uh, steps per single degree of movement. So, if your micro stepper has got a 20 uh, micro step count and you use a stepper motor of 400, then this value would become 20 times 400 would be 8000 divided by a certain gear ratio and that would give you the number of steps per number of degrees and from that way from that you can count back the number of steps per single degree and that's how you can actually find the correct value for the steps per setting okay the next value that we will need to evaluate or to calculate is the value for the velocity in the motor tuning settings of Mach 3. Now, if you look at the motor tuning page under velocity, you will always find that it's referenced as inches or millimeter per minute. Whether or not you define an axis as a linear axis or a rotational or angular axis. Now, this is maybe a little flaw in otherwise a great piece of software but if you're talking about rotational axes then this is not a linear velocity it is actually an angular velocity and the angular velocity that you need to enter here is a value in degrees per minute and not as it says here in millimeters per minute so if you enter here 360 in this uh, setting box then the maximum speed at which your uh, rotational axis will ever turn will be 360 degrees so one full rotation in one minute which is obviously rather slow in order to get to get an idea of what you would actually need to make a decent cut you can do trial and error and, and guesswork but a way to have an idea is as follows Suppose you are cutting in a piece you made on your lathe or wherever you get it, you made a cylindrical piece of stock and you're gonna make a cut in that. You're gonna make, let's say, um, you have your cylindrical piece, something like that. You lower the cutter into the wood, suppose it's wood, and you start rotating your rotational axis. What your cutter will do, obviously, is cutting a circle around the block at a certain depth. Let's say the diameter of your piece of stock is 5 cm or 50 mm, because everything is referenced to millimeters if we're talking about cutting speeds or to inches, uh, if you work with inches. Now, a typical cutting speed, if I do normal cutting work on a flat surface, is something in the area of, let's say, 2000 millimeters per minute. Per minute. If you know that your cylindrical piece of stock has a diameter of 50 millimeters, then you can easily calculate the circumference of this cylinder. The circumference will be pi times the diameter. Let's call pi 3 for uh, the sake of, uh, of easiness and then I would end up with an approximate value of, as 3 times 50 is, which means 150 millimeter total circumference. If I want to cut here in this surface at a speed of 2000 millimeter per minute 
then I can easily calculate how many times per minute this block would have to rotate in order to cut at 2,000 feet, uh, sorry, 2,000 millimeter per minute. The, the, the way to calculate is obviously by dividing 2,000 by 150. So I will need, I would need to revolve uh, the, the block at 200, uh, sorry, at 2,000 divided by 150 revolutions per minute. And if I do that, then I'm cutting at a speed of 2,000 millimeters per minute on this block of 50 millimeter diameter. Now, if you know that you would need to let the block revolve at 2,000 divided by 150 revolutions per minute, then you can also calculate how many degrees per minute you need which is the entry that Mach 3 needs to know. You simply multiply this by 360 degrees for each full revolution. And if you do this calculation, you arrive at 4800 degrees per minute. Now obviously, the smaller your stock becomes, the smaller diameter your stock has, the faster it would have to rotate to obtain the same cutting speed. That is why, in my, end, in my settings, I used 4800 just to have an idea, an order of magnitude, so to speak, and I multiplied this approximately by 2 to allow similar cutting speeds in smaller pieces of stock. And what I put in my settings is 7200, and that seems to work perfectly. Now, this value does not much or does not so much depend on the exact setup that you have. The other values like steps per absolutely depend uh, on, on, on uh, your setup because the gear ratio and so is involved. But the number of degrees that you enter, sorry, the velocity that you enter in degrees per minute, no matter the setup you have, I would think that values like four, five, seven, six thousand along those lines would be fine for most of you out there. Now the last parameter that we need to discuss is the acceleration value. Now if you open the motor tuning page and you click on the tab that defines the parameters for your angular axis, you will find under the acceleration uh, setting, you will find that it refers to a unit of inch per second per second or millimeter per second per second. Now the same remark applies as what I mentioned when I was talking about the velocity and that is that this unit is wrong because it's a linear acceleration unit and we are here talking about angular accelerations. The correct unit here should have been degrees per second per second. Now what does that mean? one degree per second per second. That means that if you do a cut on a rotational axis that would require for example an angular velocity of 200 degrees per second of course Mach 3 will need to somehow know how fast the axis can accelerate to the final speed of 200 degrees per second and it will look into the acceleration settings and if it finds that you have entered an acceleration of 1 degree per second per second then what Mach 3 will do is that each second during the acceleration the speed will increase with 1 degree per second that means that if you want a final cutting speed or a final rotation speed of 200 degrees per second and each second there is an acceleration of 1 degree per second then it will take 200 seconds to reach the final speed which is about 3 minutes, a little bit over 3 minutes and that is too slow. Now remember that when I was explaining the velocity parameter I told you that in my Mach 3 setup I entered for the velocity 7200. But this value is a value in degrees per minute. So if my machine 
would have to speed up to its maximum rotational speed it would speed up to 7000 degrees per minute and that equals 120 degrees per second meaning that if I would enter a value of 1 in the acceleration value it would take up 120 seconds to speed up to a final speed of 100 degrees per second which is 2 minutes and again that is too slow so what is good? what value do you need to enter? well I cannot really tell you which value you have to enter but what I did is I entered 500 which means that it will accelerate with 500 degrees per second each second if it needs to speed up to a rotational speed of 120 degrees per second and it accelerates in one second to 500 degrees per second then that would mean that the acceleration to the maximum speed would take approximately one quarter of a second more or less and for me it turns out that that works nicely bottom line is that whatever you enter in your acceleration value it will be a relatively high value you don't you don't need to enter 10,000 but you will need to enter something in the order of magnitude of a couple of hundred degrees per second per second otherwise the acceleration will be way too slow and I use 500 and it works perfectly I also tried entering 1000 and honestly I don't see any difference so I don't think this value is really that critical except if you would enter values that are unrealistically low like 1 or 2 or 5 or so but maybe you will have to experiment a little bit with this value but I think that 500 should be a good starting point ok the next step is to configure Mark 3 now this version of Mark 3 is just a demo version that I'm running on my computer that I have with me um, while I'm away from home for, uh, for work I'm currently in a hotel so I cannot show you the actual settings on the computer on which I am running um, my machine at home but I will be able to talk you through all the settings in this way as well first thing you need to do is go into the configuration page go to uh, general configuration and make sure here in the box where it says angular properties that um, the axis that you're going to use as your angular axis is checked if you uncheck it it's going to behave as a linear axis so you need to be sure the box for your angular axis stays checked next step is to go into the ports and pins go to motor outputs and there make sure your A axis is enabled check your own documentation to know which pins and ports you need to activate or you need to um, uh, select in order to drive the A axis correctly once you've found the correct uh, pins and port settings you click OK the next menu you have to check is the homing limits menu and for the A axis you have an option to reverse it or not I would say just leave it as it is do a test cut if it's engraved in mirror image come back and check this box the soft maximum and soft minimum values they will define at which machine coordinate the uh, rotational axis will stop now for a rotational axis there is no real danger of bumping into anything so there is no real need to define a limit what I did in my profile is I entered for the maximum value plus 100,000 and for the minimum value minus 100,000 a slow zone you don't need for the rotary axis you can just leave that at zero because you don't need it um, auto zero you can leave switched on and you hit OK and then the last thing you need to do which is maybe the most important is go to the motor tuning page select the A axis and here you enter the correct steps per value the correct velocity value and the desired acceleration value don't forget to click save settings and then OK once all that is done you are completely ready just don't forget to click save settings and um, that will make sure that next time you open Mark 3 the same settings will be available to you to operate your rotational axis and that's really all there is to it now you should have a fully functional rotational axis I will assume 
that you guys will be able to find out how to measure the location of the axis in most cases I think it's gonna be in a fixed location on your table that means that in my case the axis is along the y direction of my table that there is a fixed x value a machine coordinate for the for the x value on which my axis is centered I will assume you guys will be able to find out how to measure this if not you can always ask me how I did it in uh, the comments below on this video but there are a few other things that you will need to do that are less obvious that I will explain you right now so I already know what the uh, location is of the axis on my machine I programmed a fixture in Mark 3 and if I now ask Mark 3 to uh, bring the machine to the zero position of uh, above the axis it should nicely put the cutter exactly over the axis center line so there we go now the first thing we will need to do is make sure that the rotational axis, the imaginary axis running through the rotational setup, that this is exactly parallel to the line that is followed by the cutter when, when, when it moves up and down the axis. If it's not, if they are not parallel, then you will see that on one side the cuts will go too deep and on the other side they will be too shallow. So there is a way to measure out whether or not your axis is indeed nicely parallel. The way to do this is to make a cut on this side with a known depth, make the same cut on this side with the same depth and measure the diameter of both circles that result. If the diameter is the same then you're okay, if the diameter is different then from the difference you can calculate how much you need to shim either the tailstock or the um, headstock to get it exactly level. And just like that I end up with two cuts. And now all you need to do is just measure the diameter of both cylinders or both circles that you've just cut. Thirty one point twenty seven and on this side thirty one point twenty eight which is close enough to me. So let's say this one is one millimeter less in diameter than that one then that would mean that um, this side is half a millimeter too high because if it's half a millimeter too high it will cut one millimeter less in diameter that means that you would have to shim up this side by half a millimeter or if you can lower that one by half a millimeter but it's usually gonna be easier to shim up one side than it's gonna be to lower the other but that's the principle the next consideration is how you're gonna touch off your uh, cutting bit. Obviously, it's gonna be a little bit difficult to put a touch off plate on a piece of stock. Often it's gonna be round, so that's already difficult. Uh, others, otherwise, it may be ir an irregular surface, so that's not the easiest thing to do. I found that the best way to go if you calculate uh, circular to our rotational tool uh, tool paths is to use the uh, axis the rotational axis as a reference line but obviously it's not possible to touch off the axis it's an imaginary line in space so what we will need to do is use another surface somewhere on your table a fixed surface and reference from there and I chose this reference plane what I will need to do is measure out the distance between the reference plane on which I can put my touch off plate 
and the rotational axis itself. And that's not too difficult to do and in fact this is a very precise method that I'm going to show you. I'm sure there are other methods but this work, works very well. So how I do this is um, you position the cutter somewhere over your stock and you just make an arbitrary cut. Doesn't matter where, doesn't matter how deep. So I will do that now and we'll go from there. I will make a mark that I know which circle I'm working with. And now we can uh, note a few numbers. The first number I'm going to note is the machine coordinate at which I am now for the z-axis. Remember, this is the machine coordinate where the cutter is still touching the surface that we now cut. This machine coordinate, if I check out what I see in Mach 3, is, I will call it Z1, that is minus 79 point zero four zero zero. I will move the cutter out of the way now. Next step is to measure the diameter of the circle that we just cut. And I end up with 34.36. I will call that diameter D, which was 34.36. Now remember, when the cutter was touching the surface, the circle that I just cut, the Z value, the machine coded for the Z value was minus 79.04. Once we know the diameter, we can of course also calculate the radius of this circle. That's easy, that's gonna be 17.18. That means that when the cutter was at the Z position minus 79.04, if I would have lowered it, half the diameter being the radius of the circle that it cuts, 17.18 mm, it would have been exactly on the uh, rotational axis. So I will make a note, Z2, which is the difference between the cutter on the circular surface, minus the, um, the radius, sorry, which would put the cutter exactly on the rotational axis. I get minus 96.22. Next step is gonna be touching off the cutter from my chosen reference plane. After that, put the cutter on that reference plane and make a new note about the machine coordinate for the Z value in this position. With the cutter now exactly on the reference surface, in Mach 3 I read that the machine coordinate Z3 is now minus 61.125. Uh, if I make the difference between those two values, I will have the exact distance between the touch of surface that I will use every time for every cut and the location of the uh, rotational axis itself and that value that difference value is 35.095 and that value is the exact distance between this reference plane and the axis I will show you how I implement this number that we just measured when doing an actual um, operation. Now the next part of the video is about showing you how to calculate two paths for a rotational job setup. What I did is uh, I prepared a piece of uh, round stock on the lathe. The piece of stock that I'm gonna use is 250 millimeters long and 48 millimeters in diameter and from this piece of stock I will cut a cylinder an exact cylinder of 180 millimeters long and 44 millimeters in diameter I will show you how in RhinoCam 
the two paths are defined, how this works. And then later on I will also show you the actual cutting on the CNC machine. And then based on this 44mm diameter cylinder, I will show you in Vectric Aspire how you can create a toolpath for an engraving on the, on the surface of this cylinder. So the next step now is to go into the CAM module. Actually Rhino itself is a CAD program, but inside of this CAD program there is a CAM module that you can install, which is called Rhino CAM, which is uh, specifically aimed at um, calculating toolpaths for CNC machines. Before I do that, I will get rid of the dimensions here, which will only be in our way. And I will open up the CAM module for milling work. Close this panel, that's not necessary for the moment. Now the first thing that we will need to do is tell the software which type of machine we're going to use. Which is done here in the machine uh, panel. Now it's beyond the scope of this video to explain you all the settings here in each and every panel. But basically the most important settings for the machine is that you tell the CNC, sorry, that you tell the CAM software that you are actually, actually using a 4-axis machine and also what the orientation of this fourth axis is. In my, uh, in my um, situation, it's oriented along the positive Y axis of my machine, which is set here. I click OK and I close the panel. Next step is to tell the software which type of post processor you're going to use later on. In my case, I use Mark 3 and I use millimeters as my unit. So I'll select that and click OK. And the next step is telling the software what the size and what the shape of my stock is. So I will open the stock uh, menu. I will tell the software I'm using a cylindrical stock. As I uh, told you earlier on, it's oriented along the Y axis the center position that's something that is something I will define later on I will tell it it has a radius of remember I told you the stock that I prepared had a, has a diameter of 48 millimeters so the radius is gonna be 24 millimeters and the length of my stock is 250 millimeters and I click OK now if I toggle the stock visibility on here you will see that the software shows you the stock which is in orange and inside of this stock there is the part I want to actually machine out of this stock being the cylinder I designed earlier on and as you can see this uh, cylinder is slightly smaller than the stock as obviously should be the case if you want to machine it out of this stock now before we go on there's first something else that I need to tell you in fact if we are talking about um, a cam module inside a CAD program like we have here there will be two coordinate systems involved one coordinate system is the coordinate system for the CAD drawing which is this one and in this program it's called the world coordinate system and we are going to introduce a second coordinate system once we start defining toolpaths because as you probably already know every toolpath should have an origin. The origin of the toolpath that we are going to uh, define is what is called um, the work zero position. What I do in every job setup to keep everything clean and simple is to make sure that both coordinates are at the same point which makes for me everything more um, more transparent. So the first thing what I will do is align here in the align uh, tab. I will align my world coordinate system, the world CS or world coordinate system. I will base that on the part that I drew. I can choose to base it on the stock or on the part. I will select the part. I will tell the software that I want the zero uh, point of my world coordinate system on the mid Z position of my uh, actual drawing and lengthwise in this direction I want the center of my world coordinate system in the center of my work piece 
and I click OK. Now if you look sideways at um, the part that I actually want to machine out, you see that the coordinate system is now exactly in the middle of my part. What you'd still see, however, is that my stock is not yet centered, or better, that my part is not yet centered inside my stock. That's gonna be the next step, and it is to align the stock. I will tell the software that I want my part to be aligned Z-wise in the center of my stock, and lengthwise, what, it's, what is here referred to as the XY alignment, lengthwise I also want that my part is centered in the middle of my stock and I click OK. And now you will see that we have um, a part that is exactly centered in the stock, both vertically as horizontally, that my world coordinate system is in the middle of my part and obviously also in the middle of my stock. And the next step is starting to define the machine parameters. The first machine parameter that we will need is the work zero. Because earlier on we talked about the world coordinate system, but that's not the machining or the toolpath uh, origin. The toolpath origin is the work zero point. The work zero point, I will also refer or uh, put that on a point relative to the part that we drew. So I will click set to part box. I will choose just the same as I did with the world coordinate system to put the work zero point at the mid Z value and also lengthwise in the center. And I click save. Now, once we've done that, the work zero and the world coordinate system is in the same point. My part is centered in the stock and we are ready to define the machining parameters. The machining operation itself is going to be a 4-axis machining operation. I will select a facing strategy, which will actually let the cutter move along the face of the surface that I designed. In this case, it's a cylindrical surface. Before I do that, I will toggle off the stock visibility. You will see in a minute why. And I will open the facing program tab. The first thing that the program wants to know is when the tool is following the face of the cylinder going up and down, going up and down, where does it need to stop? What is the limiting region? And the limiting region I can select here, select curves as regions, and I select this curve and this curve, and I uh, right click, and now you see the regions for the machining is defined or bounded by region 1, which is the first circle, and region 2, which is the other circle. The tool that I'm going to use is already programmed in my tool database, along with the feeds and speeds that will be copied automatically into the feeds and speeds tab. It's going to be a 6mm end mill. Then I click on feeds and speeds. I will leave that as is, because usually I do cut in softwood at 6000 RPM and I use a cutting speed of 1500 millimeters per minute. The clearance plane lets you define how high the bit needs to be retracted when it's not cutting, but the software usually does a pretty good job of calculating that automatically for me. So I leave that at automatic. In the roughing tab, I can define a few cut parameters such as the tolerance. I will put that on 001. But the step over uh, distance, I will leave that at 25% of my tool diameter and then I go to the cut levels. Now this is a little bit more difficult to understand. Here I can define what the location is of the cut geometry. In other words, from which point the depth of cut is referenced. You can choose a point yourself, but I will choose at the top. That means that the top of the part that I designed is gonna be the start point for depth control. If the part is already dimensioned correctly, then I actually don't want the cutter to go any lower than just to the top of the part that I have here in my design. So I leave the cut depth control on zero, which will lower the cutter until the point where it is exactly on a 44 millimeter uh, diameter cylinder, or in other words, 22 millimeters from the uh, center line of my rotational axis. And then the entry and exit, I will leave that at none, none, 
which will make my tool enter vertically and exit vertically. And I will click generate. Now what we see here, the blue lines are the paths that the tool will actually follow. And so it's going to go up and down and up and down along the surface of my, uh, of my cylinder. In doing so, it will cut two millimeters into my stock. And I can show you that if I toggle the stock visibility and then I uh, let the program simulate the actual cut, you will see that a cylinder emerges from the stock, which is slightly smaller than the stock that I'm actually going to use. And that's also how it's going to look after the cut is done on the CNC machine. And the last step will be to export this job by post-processing. I already selected the post-processor to be Mach 3 millimeter. I will call this um, Rhino Cam Cylinder 2 Path. This file I will use later on on the CNC machine to actually do the cut. Okay, now that I have the toolpath created to cut the cylinder out of the stock that I already chucked up in my rotary axis, it's time to actually cut it out. The first step is going to be to touch off the cutter on my reference surface and after that enter the correction value in Mark 3 for the distance between my reference surface and the actual axis on which I want to have my Z0. Uh, the script for the tool touch off retracted the tool 45.42 millimeters above the reference surface. I will add now the difference between the reference surface and the axis in Mark 3 as the new Z value for this position. For me this difference is 35.08 millimeters if I add that to 45.42, I end up with 80.5 and I hit enter. And that tells Mark 3 the tool is now at 80.5 millimeters above its zero value, which is actually the rotary axis itself. The only thing left to do now is uh, zero the y axis. So I will locate my cutter approximately over the middle of my stock. It doesn't have to be inch perfect because my stock is large enough to cut out a 180 millimeter cylinder from a 250 millimeter long stock. So if it's approximately in the middle, that's more than good enough. The only thing now left to do is to regenerate the toolpath with the new work coordinate that I just defined. I hit regenerate toolpath and I should be ready to run the program. So I hit cycle start and let's see what happens. The last tool part that we're going to create is make an engraving into the cylinder that we just cut out and I'm going to use Vectric Aspire for that. I start with a, a new clean uh, workspace and I go into gadgets and I select wrapping and I go to wrapped job setup. So I select that. The software needs to know on which cylinder I'm going to define the wrap job setup. Obviously it's going to be the same cylinder as the one that we cut out which is 180 millimeters long and 45 millimeters in diameter. It's oriented along the y-axis. I will leave the xy drawing origin as it is. The z0 value is on the cylinder axis and I select a simple cylindrical wrap and I click OK. What happens now is that the software opens a workspace and this workspace corresponds to um, the surface of the cylinder that we just defined that is unwrapped and laid out on a flat surface. And on this flat surface we will design what we want to cut out in the actual cylinder. I will go for a simple text engraving. I will use the word wrapped. I select some kind of, uh, some kind of fancy uh, font. There we go. And I click apply and close. I will uh, reposition this a little bit, 
rotate it like so and I will make it a little bit larger like so and that should be okay next step is to go to the toolpaths in the setup I will leave everything as it is the initial job setup that we did on the first um, in the first menu should also take care of all these settings so I will not go into exact detail of what these all mean I click OK and I select a V carving toolpath I choose a 60 degree V bit with a 12 millimeter diameter that should be more than enough the feeds and speeds for this tool I have already predefined in my uh, tool library and I click OK the flat depth is the maximum depth to which the toolpath will go let's say 3 millimeters that should be fine I select my vectors and I click calculate what we get now if I do preview is a flat representation of the cut that is later on going to be um, translated into a circular cut what the software will do is once we post process the toolpath which is now still a flat toolpath it will translate all the movements in the x direction to a rotation of the a axis I can simulate that in toolpaths I can go to toolpath drawing and wrap the x values around the y axis this is just a simulation of what is actually going to happen I will rotate this a little bit that we can see something and that is what we should end up with next step is to save the toolpath close I will save it I have to choose the correct post processor for that the correct one is still Mark 3 but not a regular one but the wrapped or the wrapping post processor I need to wrap the X values to the A axis there is also a possibility to wrap the Y values to the A axis but it's actually going to be the X axis movements that need to be wrapped around the A axis and I will do that with millimeters as my primary unit and I click OK then I do save toolpath to the file again it asks me the diameter of the cylinder but nothing changed here so I leave that at 44 which I defined in the beginning and again it wants to know if I indeed want my Z0 value to be the center of the cylinder which is the case and I click OK and I click save and now we will go to the machine and do the actual engraving now that we have our toolpath for our engraving and that we have already prepared a perfect cylinder with the dimensions on which our engraving toolpath is, uh, is based we can start engraving the text that we created in uh, Vectric Aspire the steps will be exactly the same as what we did for the cylindrical toolpath I already installed the V-bit so the first step will be to do the touch-off as you see the bit is retracted once more to 45.42 millimeters I will add to that again that's the same value of 35.08 which makes for the Z value 8 0 0.5 enter and then I have to zero the Y coordinate and as I mentioned on the note the Y zero coordinate for this toolpath is not in the middle of the stock but at the very bottom of the cylinder on which the text is going to be engraved so I will zero the Y to the bottom the base I should say of the cylinder I will also zero the rotation axis regenerate the toolpath and let's start cutting And this is the end result. So that brings us to the end of the video. It turned out to be quite a long one, but I tried to explain all the different aspects you need to know to get started with your own rotary setup. If there are any questions or comments or even things that you guys think 
that might be wrong, please feel free to comment below. I will be looking forward to all your comments and suggestions to improve the quality of my videos in the future. Thank you for watching and see you next time.